pushing buttons and pulling triggers. This is Gun Funny. Welcome to Gun Funny episode 165. Today I'm going to chat with Sam from Prep Medic, discuss the California assault weapons case being heard this week, highlight a new long range optic from Primary Arms, and talk about a mummified Twinkie that is baffling scientists. I'm your host, Ava Flannell, and Sam, how are you doing today? I'm great. Thanks for having me on today. Of course. Of course. All right. So before we get into it, we're going to talk about Manicore Arms real quick. If you guys are building an AR or you're looking for a new handguard, maybe you have something that doesn't really meet your needs for the accessories that you have, I would highly recommend the Transformer Rail. What's great about it is as new accessories come out, and let's say it's Key Mod, M Lock, Picatinny, you have the option of changing out all of the panels on the Transformer Rail. So it's basically future proof and you can also mix and match. So let's say you have something that's Picatinny, something that's M-Lock. That's really the perfect accessory for your AR. Check it out at manorcorearms.com. Don't forget to use the code GUNFUNNY15 and that gets you 15% off. Learn the things you never knew on Deconstructing the Industry. Sam, I'm really excited to have you on. I've been looking for a new guest, trying to mix it up a little bit. And I came across your Instagram account and I was like, oh, this would be kind of interesting to interview you. And I don't know a ton about you. So I guess I'm right there with the listeners. So can you just fill us in on what it is that you do in this industry? Yeah, absolutely. My primary industry is actually in the medical field and kind of through that have gotten into the gun community and some of the other stuff you talk about here. Primarily, I'm a paramedic, been a paramedic for about eight years now. Most of that experience was in central Iowa. Went there, was a paramedic on the streets, and they had two SWAT teams there. And basically, there was a need and there was no medical component to that college town, about 100,000 people. So I ended up becoming a reserve deputy with them and getting on their SWAT team and being the originator of their tactical medical team on the Story County ERT. From there, I was doing a lot of what I thought was cool stuff and was also doing a lot of interviews and we weren't having applicants. So one day kind of decided that I don't know why people aren't going into paramedicine or law enforcement. I just don't know why there isn't more interest and kind of just decided to start a YouTube channel out of nowhere. From there, a couple of years, it grew from grinding out a video every week for six months for 100 subscribers to about 200,000. So that's kind of where I got my start in the social media realm. And of course, Instagram spiraled off of that. And then since then, moved out to Colorado, joined a special operations response team out here, as well as an educator for pretty large EMS agencies. So in that regards, I'm still doing a lot of SWAT medicine and some other things as well. Wow, that's really cool. And describe what exactly is SWAT medicine? Yeah, so traditional paramedics aren't really able to go into dangerous scenes. You know, one of the first things they teach you in your EMT basic school is scene safety. You know, you can't put yourself at risk. You're not prepared to handle those violent situations. You know, you're not armed. You really have limited tools. So a lot of what you do is you wait outside and you let law enforcement clear the building. They make everything safe and you come in. And most of the time that works fine. But when you have barricaded subjects or you have school shootings or these horrific events where SWAT teams have prolonged operations, the scene's not going to be safe for hours. You need a medical component in there because it takes about four minutes to bleed out of your femoral artery. Same with your jugular. So you need intervention really quickly. Mm -hmm. And that's where SWAT medics come in. We attach in Iowa as part of the entry team on their SWAT team, would go in with them. And then if there was a medical issue, would go in and start helping people. Here, I am actually part of my EMS agency, and we attach to two different SWAT teams. And it just allows us to get closer to patients quicker, do a lot more good for them in the meantime, and then get them to a waiting ambulance or transport them in one of our vehicles. And it also helps the law enforcement officer if they go down and they can't be reached, we can get to them, we can get them out. So it's really good for everybody all the way around. Yeah, definitely. That's so interesting. Do you also have a gun? Are you armed when you're in these positions or are you just trying to get to the person that needs medical aid? 
where I'm at now, we're unsworn. We're an unarmed component. They armor us up and they give us a bodyguard, but that's about as far as it goes. Now in Iowa, we were armed. So it all depends on where you are and what your agency will let you do. Mm -hmm. Healthcare is starting to adopt to that, but it's hard for somebody in a risk department to look at align paramedic and say, no, they should definitely be armed because most of the time they just don't understand what we do. Yeah. So in Colorado, we're an unarmed component. Mm, Okay. And what led you to where you are now? You know, it was a combination of things. I think, you know, through high school, I just wasn't sure what I wanted to do. You know, I didn't feel a purpose in a lot of different areas. And I kind of found ski patrol on happenstance and kind of this outdoor austere medicine and met a lot of great mentors in that environment. And then from there, it just grew. I saw it as a way to, you know, it was personally fulfilling to me. I could go to work, feel like I was doing something good. And then it was a great combination between kind of this white collar, I guess you'd say respect, or, you know, you talk to people and, you know, you're in medicine or your medical care provider, but then you had the kind of a blue collar attitude and it really kind of fit the bill for all all worlds for me as, you know, it was something that was fun to do, fulfilling, and what I saw as a great career. So that kind of spurred me on. And then from there, most of the success in my career has been found from just finding needs within the community. And for me, SWAT medicine was a huge need where I was at in Central Iowa and was able to fill that with my skill set. So that's kind of what jump-started me into that area. Hmm. That's cool. What is your day-to-day job like usually with all the different hats that you wear? Absolutely. My day-to-day, kind of my day job at my agency is I'm an educator and I go around and I'm basically what's known as a, a mentor. So I go around and help our staff if they're having clinical issues, anything like that. But our special operations response team, our sort team does a variety of different things. And that's kind of an on-call team we do. We do about two to three call outs a week. So for me is I'll be doing my normal educational routine with our street crews. And then if we get a call, we attach to a bunch of different entities. So first and foremost is our two SWAT teams. If they go out on anything, we attach right to them. But we are also called to wildfires as line medics and to provide ambulance to wildfires. Obviously, we've got a lot of those going on right now in the Mm -hmm. state. I was actually going to ask you about that because you're closer to the fires than I am. You're on the north side, right? Yep. I'm in northern Colorado and I was actually up at the Cameron Peak fire for two weeks kind of early on in its stages as a ambulance up on the fire line. So we do that. That's a big thing we do in the summers. And then we also attach to the search and rescue teams in northern Colorado and we go with them as medical specialists. And then we also do some high angle work with them and we attach to the dive rescue teams as their medical support. So it can change I've got so many different uniforms in my car that we can have to change into at a moment's notice. Mm -hmm. So my daily routine really isn't much of a routine, to tell you the truth. Yeah. You must see so many different things by doing all of that stuff. I really do. And that's one of the reasons I love this career is that, you know, no two days are the same. Your patients are in different places, in different situations. You have to do different things to even just get to them. Yeah. So always learning and, you know, always kind of adapting to whatever it is. So we see quite a lot, you know, in the Rocky Mountains, we've got climbers that fall, motorcyclists that go off the road. You've got manhunts for people hiding out in the woods. You know, you name it, Mm -hmm. uh, we're doing it. I would imagine that you probably also see quite a bit of gory stuff, lots of blood. So one, I want to know, how do you deal with that? Because most people just don't have the stomach for it. And then once you answer that, I have a follow up question. For sure. I think one of the interesting things is, is I can't watch gory shows or, you know, YouTube videos of people getting their legs broken or anything like that. I can't do it. When you're in a professional capacity and you have a job to do, it has never bothered me. That's not to say everybody's experience is the same, but I've always found that it's a completely different mindset when you're responding to it, when you have a job to do, you know, when you've been trained to deal with it, as opposed to kind of helplessly watching from the sidelines, as it were. Mm -hmm. So for me, I've never had an issue. But, you know, I think different people take that in different ways. And the nice thing about EMS is that you usually start as an EMT basic, which is a pretty quick course to take. You start working as that on a basic life support ambulance somewhere. 
And hopefully that's enough of a primer for you to figure out if this is something you want to do and can handle, or if you maybe don't want to pursue the paramedic route and go down that avenue. Mm -hmm. And then also, so my cousin, she just became a special agent and we were talking and it's kind of funny because I'm just like, wow, your job is so badass. You do all this cool stuff. And sometimes I think, man, I should do SWAT or something, kind of up my game a little bit. Although it's funny because she just moved here about a month ago on her first assignment. This might be a little TMI, but here I'm like, you're such a badass and you can carry a gun in airports and government buildings. And she messaged me at 1 a.m. Yeah, I'm still here. We're probably not going to leave till 3 a.m. And I'm digging through a trash looking for a tampon because it was evidence. And I'm like, oh, wow. Yeah, I don't really want to switch you places at all. But we were talking the other day and we were talking about, say, we had to pack a wound or use a tourniquet or something like that. And I've taken a few of those classes. And the first thing that you learn is that you put gloves on so that you're not exposing yourself to any diseases. But I have a hard time thinking that people are going to have that mindset and they're going to be calm enough to remember to protect themselves. I would think that most people would be in such a hurry to save another person's life that they typically wouldn't put the gloves on. I would imagine, obviously, you do this as a profession, but how often do you think, like, let's say I'm driving down the road and somebody gets into a car accident, I get out of my car and I see the person's just bleeding and they need medical attention. I just don't think I'd have that mindset to put the gloves on. I'm actually really glad you brought that up uh, because every time I post a video on YouTube and I demonstrate a skill and I'm not wearing gloves or I have a kit that I packed and I don't have gloves in it, people freak out in the comments about it. And I always kind of chuckle about that. Now, I'm going to preface everything by saying that if you're in the mindset to put on gloves and if you have gloves, that's best practice. You know, that's the Mm -hmm. safest thing for you and your patient. But you're absolutely right. You're in that situation. If you're a civilian and somebody got shot, chances are that somebody you know, Mm -hmm. you know, family member, friend, you know, somebody you're in class with, who knows, you're not in the mindset to put on those gloves. And those gloves become a Rubik's Cube when you're super stressed out, just trying to get your hands into them. Yeah. Your skin is a great barrier. Intact skin is an excellent barrier against pathogens. Almost nothing is going to be absorbed through your skin that can make you sick. Now, there are some exceptions, but as a general rule, that's the case for bloodborne pathogens. Where Mm -hmm. you run into problems if you have an open cut or, Mm -hmm. you know, your hands are drying, your cuticles are bleeding or something like that, you can have a transmission of disease, but even so, the risk is relatively small. So like you said, you know, if you think of it and you can put on gloves, otherwise, just know that, you know, once you get done with that, wash your hands off, good hand hygiene and all of that stuff. And if you're concerned about it, you can report it to the ER. But in my experience, it's not a huge deal. Most of our medics have blood on their pants or above their glove at Mm -hmm. least, you know, once a set. So be safe. But also, I don't really think that's a requirement in a lot of these super emergent situations. Mm -hmm. Wow, you're actually the first person that has ever said that because most people are like, no, you just have to put on the gloves. You just think about it. I don't know. I would think the bigger heart that you have and the better Samaritan that you might be. I just don't think that that would be my first thing. And I have been in very traumatic situations where somebody was bleeding and I didn't think about, oh, let me protect myself. You're more worried about saving their life. That's good to know, though, that there's not that many risks involved if you forget to put your gloves on. Yeah. And the other part to that is, is that if you're a carrier for something, you know, and you give that to your patient, I don't know about any case law about that. I don't know if that's going to come back to bite you. There's the chance there. So Mm -hmm. it's also for your patient's protection. I guess this is just kind of my experience with it is that you do what you have to do in the moment. And as a professional, always wear gloves. But as you know, the bystander that just sees a dude get smoked on his motorcycle is probably not where your mind is at. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, actually, isn't that kind of screwed up? Imagine, let's say you just saved somebody's life and you gave them a disease as a result. But if you didn't do whatever it is that you did, pack their wound, use a tourniquet, they probably would have died. But then there's maybe the chance with everyone suing everyone nowadays that there's that chance that they could potentially have a lawsuit, which is just so screwed up to me. Absolutely. I mean, you are protected by Good Samaritan laws, Mm -hmm. you know, so I wouldn't want anybody listening to this podcast thinking that, you know, I'm afraid to act because I might get sued. If you're acting in good faith and you're keeping the interventions relatively basic, so, you know, tourniquets, wound packing, chest seals, those kind of things, 
you're protected under law. They can't sue you for it if it was in good faith and you're trying your best to help that person. If something happens, generally you have a good defense to that. So one of the reasons I have my channel is to really encourage people to act in those situations because we have a lot of bystander effects where people stand around, record horrific scenes with their phones when they could be doing good. They could actually be helping and saving somebody's life. So, you know, I really want to encourage that. Yeah, I couldn't agree with you more. And that's, uh, I can't tell you how much that irks me when I do see these videos and nobody's administering aid. I just don't know how these people could do that. Just sit there and calmly record the video. It's definitely something that bothers me. I'm going to take a quick break and talk about SB Tactical. Their TF-1913, it looks fantastic on the SIG MPX, the MCX, other similar guns. It's about 10 inches long, but it folds, making it even more compact and easy to transport. It's a great addition to any gun, in my opinion, and I have a few. Love them. They're on their website right now for $199, but but you're going to use that code GUNFUNNY15, and that gets you 15% off, and that is at sb-tactical.com. What kind of videos do you typically put out on your YouTube and what would you say are your most popular ones? I try to put kind of a variety out there. What started for me is kind of kit videos like, hey, this is what I have on my plate carrier for SWAT operations. This is the rifle I'm carrying and the attachments and putting out that kind of thing. And then that evolved into talking more about EMS in general and why and how to get into it, which further evolved into aid videos of This is some basic interventions you can do. These are the supplies you can carry to do them. Here are some different situations I'd consider making a first aid kit for. So all of those videos are on my page, and then they're all categorized on there. I'd say the most popular with the most views are really the kit videos. You know, everybody likes seeing what people are carrying for equipment. Mm Mm-hmm when the new tactical pants are, that kind of thing. I think the most important videos, I would say, are going to be the aid videos. That's another thing is I love gear. I'm a pack rat. I will buy every piece of gear I can, much to the displeasure of my wife. But at the end of the day, it's your knowledge and your skill set. Yeah. You know, and that I think is the most important aspect of medical care. And I'm sure you see it in the gun industry. There's a lot of debate about 45 or 9 millimeter or how barrel length or anything and you see you know professional shooters that's not the conversation it doesn't matter they can pick up any gun yeah and do good with it and i think the same thing can be said for medical care is if you have the knowledge you can make it work no matter what you have Mm -hmm. yeah and there's also just a huge misconception that the more expensive the gun is the better you're going to shoot like that suddenly is going to just make you mysteriously have skills whereas i think it's more important that you spend more money on training than you do on buy a quality gun, obviously, something that's not going to jam. But I think that there's not enough money being spent on training as much as there should be. Interesting point on that is if you're familiar with hemostatic agents at all Mm -hmm. uh, for wound packing, there's a lot of people that say, well, I need the hemostatic agents. That has to be what I'm packing the wound with. And that is best practice. That's the gold standard. But most studies that have come out show us that a t-shirt packed into the wound with good technique and good pressure held for the required amount of time will be just as effective as the hemostatic agents. So Mm -hmm. if you don't have that, if you can't spend the 30 bucks on that, you can take your t-shirt off and shove that into the wound and it's going to save a life almost at the same time. And one of the things that I just kind of assumed before I took a medical class is that you just hold it as tight as you possibly can over the wound. But when you're packing the wound, you actually twirl it up around your finger, push it down, twirl it up, push it in. And you're literally, as they say, packing the wound. You're not just holding a cloth over that wound trying to keep the blood in. And I think that's also Absolutely. kind of a misconception. Absolutely. I mean, the name of the game is pressure. And you have a deep wound cavity. Your tissue's pliable. As you bleed into a cavity with just pressure over top of it, it's just going to continue to bleed. You can hold about a liter to two liters of blood in each thigh from your femoral artery. You can hold three liters of blood in your pelvic girdle. You can lose a ton of blood in body cavities. So 
you have to get that pressure right up against the artery to stop it from bleeding in the first place. So it doesn't just bleed internally. You can make the wound look pretty by wrapping it on the outside, but they're still going to die because you don't actually have cessation of bleeding at the source. Yeah. And then also, I know some people that have tampons in their kit, which is a horrible idea. (laughs) Can you just explain why that is? Kind of like I just said, it's pressure. Tampons are designed to absorb blood. And we don't want to absorb blood. That's not the function. You know, I don't need this huge bulky dressing. Similarly, a tampon, when you get it wet, if you just dip it into some water, it's going to expand and become this incredibly porous device. Mm -hmm. So while it might be kind of this hard puck material at first, as soon as it touches blood, it's going to expand and start absorbing it. So when you put it into a gunshot wound, it's not actually stopping the blood. It'll just absorb some of it. And then you're right back to where you started. Except that your buddy's dying of humiliation as well as blood loss. Right. No kidding. What are some other things that you could use if you aren't around a med kit? You know, honestly, t-shirts work great because they're really close, or for wound packing at least, because they're a very tight knit fabric. You know, you don't want something that's super porous. Mm -hmm. So if you've got your t-shirt, your pants or something like that, strip of fabric, it really doesn't matter so long as it's more of a dense fabric. It's going to work well. So that's kind of your go-to for bleeding control. I wouldn't recommend trying to do a makeshift tourniquet. Mm -hmm. Um, In my eight years as a paramedic, I've never seen a makeshift tourniquet work. Belts are an absolute no-go for tourniquets. Mm -hmm. So if you don't have a commercial device like a cat tourniquet or a soft T-wide or a TMT, something like that, I would say just pack the wound as best you can and get them to definitive care, at least when it comes to stop the bleed. Okay. And that's even on an extremity or an arm or a leg or something? Absolutely. You can get most blood flow to stop with that direct With packing it. Okay. Interesting. Let's go back to tourniquets because there's also a lot of debate as to which tourniquets work well and which ones don't. What are your thoughts on that? So there is a group called the Committee for Tactical Combat Casualty Care. And they're really the group that advises the DOD in pretty much everything they do. And almost everything we know about blood control comes from our wars in the Middle East. And we have a ton of data on what works and what doesn't. So the Committee for Tactical Combat Casualty Care does systematic literature reviews of all the studies that are done on different devices. And they, every number of years, they'll put out recommendations on what they believe the acceptable devices are based off the literature. So it used to be for a while, it was the combat application tourniquet by North American Rescue and the soft T-wide by Tactical Medical Solutions were your two main TCCC approved tourniquets. They since expanded that, and now we've got a bunch more on that list. I think like the SAM XT, TMT, I'm going to forget. There's a huge list you can find on their website. Uh, It's Deployed Medicine. I forget what it is, dot something. I'll find it and send that to you so you can put it in the show notes. But you can get all the advice on what to use there. The ones to stay away from, I'd say, are anything that uses an elastic mechanism to uh, stop the bleeding. So Mm -hmm. the big ones, and there's a lot of controversy on this, is the rat's tourniquet. Mm -hmm. It was evaluated in the literature. It was found to be inferior blood stoppage. It's more painful because it's thinner. You have higher occlusion pressures, so you have more tissue damage and issues there. And every time I say this, I get flack for it because, you know, I know there's a lot of people that really like it. You know, Doc T is a super great guy. He's the guy that invented it, I believe. But he is a super good guy, was a Green Beret, was a medic and stuff. So this is nothing against him, but the product in my experience has been inferior and has caused some issues in the market. Well, and especially because it's so thin, so you have to spread out as you're wrapping around in order to create, what is it, a three inch? Yeah, you want it as wide as you can get. So that it relies on wrapping it around multiple times to get that occlusion on it. Mm -hmm. So this isn't to say that the rat's tourniquet will never work. Yeah. But when it's compared to the other devices on the market, you just have a lot of issues that come up with it. And then it's locking mechanism for the tail of it. There's some anecdotal reports of that coming off in patient movement if you're dragging somebody or trying to extricate somebody from a situation. Yeah, that makes sense. Where all do you keep your kits? 
I would imagine that you have kits everywhere. Do you carry a kit on you? Yeah, I carry an ankle kit almost everywhere I go, whether I'm on duty, off duty, just because it's so simple. You know, I put on my socks in the morning, I throw on the ankle kit and the two I have, I've got the Dark Angel Medical and the Warrior Poet Society ankle kit and, you know, not sponsored by either one. Um, but those have been my two favorites. So I carry those on me and that just has some uh, clotting gauze, uh, chest seal, tourniquet, and then a trauma bandage for just your major bleeding and everything. Mm-hmm. And then I have, I've got my kit for work in my car. You know, I've got stop the bleed kits throughout the house just because, you know, I'm that guy. I'd say for the listener, if you're going to carry a kit, you should have something in reach. You know, like I said earlier, it's about four minutes to bleed out of your femoral artery before you're dead. So keeping something in your car and thinking that that's always the option to run to your car and run back in time is kind of naive because you are not within the two minutes of your car as it stands. And then that's not even counting the time it takes you to unlock it, grab your bag, get back to the purse and unwrap it, put it on. So I would advise having something in reach, you know, I, whether that's a backpack, ankle kit, you know, something at your desk, just something that you can get to really quickly. And it's not just for gunshots either. You know, this isn't a tactical kit. Mm -hmm. We've got chainsaws, motorcycles, cars, you know, hiking accidents, industrial explosions, you know, it, there's a whole variety of things that this will help you with. Yeah. Well, I know even whenever my friends and I, we go to the range, I always take out my trauma kit and go, all right, guys, here's the kit. If anybody needs it, it's right here. It's better than obviously being in the trunk of my car or my range bag or something like that. But you're right. That's I mean, great practice, actually, because that's what we do at the beginning of every SWAT training. We pull out one of our bags. We set it somewhere and there's a big announcement made. Hey, this is where the bag is. That's the vehicle we're going to be transporting a patient in. This is the person driving the vehicle. And you just have that pre-medical plan beforehand. And everybody knows it. The medical guys, the non-medical guys, because everybody we're with is trained in Stop the Bleed. And it's a really easy thing to implement. So, you know, just because you're the medic, all right, now I'm the medic and I got shot. I need somebody else to know where stuff is and how to get to it. So yeah. that that's great practice while you're on the range. Well, I guess I have to up my game though and now figure out who's going to be the getaway driver, who's <laughs> going to be the one that administers aid. No. <laughs> also, you mentioned that you teach classes. Do you teach classes to civilians? I haven't broken into the, I'm sorry, I do teach Stop the Bleed. And I teach Stop the Bleed to a lot of big businesses and to church groups and schools and other big gatherings and some Boy Scouts and Girl Scouts here and there. So that's the one I kind of teach in that realm, just because I think that has some of your biggest bang for your buck in Mm -hmm. what will actually save lives and make a huge difference. You know, it's not super in-depth. It's literally see a hole, plug a hole. Mm -hmm. But that's what I teach mainly to civilians. And then the rest of my teaching is generally in the professional realm. Okay. I have noticed that there isn't really a ton of classes offered for civilians, which seems a little funny to me because there's a bunch of classes that are offered to teach you how to use a gun properly. But the chance of you actually using your gun are probably less likely than the chance of you having to administer aid on somebody. So I'm actually surprised that it's just not as easily offered as any of the other classes that would revolve around saving a life. I agree. There really should be more. I think a couple of things that deter people from teaching them is the potential liability for it. Mm -hmm. You know, I think on a lot of, you know, carbine courses or pistol courses, there's very little liability outside of it because you're teaching gun manipulations. You're teaching, you know, a lot of subjective items. When it comes to medical care, I go teach a civilian and I teach them something that's not vetted by the medical community and they go use that, there's a chance that comes back to me. So that's not to say that it's something that's impossible to do. You know, you can get a medical director and a backer pretty easily for those classes. But I think there's just a lot of fear from, I guess, the medical community on that. Yeah. And then also, I think there's like until recently, medical care has always kind of been the, I guess, the big sigh. You know, nobody really wants to do it. My first SWAT team I was with, they didn't want to train medical when I brought it up. You know, it's not the cool thing. It's not the glamorous thing. It's kind of mundane and boring. And I think that's shifting, but also I think that's kind of kept it out of some of these tactical courses. But I have seen a lot of CCW courses teaching Stop the Bleed, which is excellent. Yeah. 
And in order to be qualified to teach these classes, do you have to be TCCC certified? No. Stop the Bleed has its own credentialing requirements. And I think basically the only requirement to teach that is that you're a medical provider in some way and that you've taken the course. You know, they list what medical providers count. Like, I don't think a CNA counts, but like nurse, paramedic, EMT, doctor, like if you're one of those and then you go through the course, you can just get signed off and go through and become an instructor. It's a very set curriculum and it's actually set by the government. The DOD kind of came out with this, but that being said, not all are created equal. So make sure you vet your instructors before you sign up for one of these classes. Yeah, definitely. What has been your proudest moment so far in your career? Well, actually, pretty recently, I'm uh, transitioning within my service. I just got hired as a critical care flight paramedic with them. So I'm pretty proud of that because that's a very competitive yeah. area to be in. You know, everybody wants to be on a helicopter. So very proud of that. And then also just very proud of prep medic as a channel. You know, never in a million years did I think that I'd be, you know, getting invited on podcasts <laughs> <laughs> to hear what I had to say. So wait, so no, you're so saying that this is your proudest moment being on this podcast? No, I'm kidding. I, yes, I pretty much just said that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, even just building a following on YouTube, because I have a YouTube channel that I started, I don't know, maybe two years ago, and it's like 18,000 subscribers. Granted, I don't post as often because you know that creating content, it's not as easy as it looks. Like for you to push out that five minute video, it definitely took a lot more effort and time. You have to take your camera equipment to the range. Well, in my case, it's the range, record the content edit the content, upload the content. You got to make sure that you have all of the keywords. And it's one of the things that I do that requires for me the most work. And there's not a lot of benefit from it because you'll even get people where you're trying to help somebody and give them advice and you'll still get those internet trolls that are just like, why would you even do that? That's stupid. Or you're ugly or just whatever, just the dumbest things that they could possibly say. And it's just like, cool, well, you're not paying for this content. So sorry you didn't like it, but carry on. Do you agree with me or am I the only one who thinks like this? <laughs> no, it absolutely is because, you know, my videos average, you know, between five and 20 minutes in length. And even a simple video, even a simple video where I've got a product in front of me, I know everything about it. And all I'm doing is going through piece by piece. Maybe it takes me an hour to film. And then on average, I'm spending, you know, eight to 16 hours a week to just edit that and get it up. Yeah. And majority of comments are very positive, very supportive. You know, people give good feedback, whatever it is. But then, you know, you spend all of this time and then you got that one guy that comes up and just criticizes everything. Crazy stuff. Yeah. And, you know, it doesn't bother you. It doesn't bother you at first. You know, you, you get it at first. You're like, ah, oh, whatever. It's yeah. a troll. But then by the 50th comment, you're like, all right, it's starting to take a toll. <laughs> yep. Yeah, it's like I have to like have a very set time of day that I go in and look at my comments because, yeah. you know, I, I know I'm just going to make myself mad if I look at them right before bed or something. Mm -hmm. So, you know, like in the morning, cup of coffee, calmly go through it and uh, give myself the rest of the day to decompress. Yeah. Yeah. And it does help all the positive comments because I would imagine just like me, the positive comments absolutely outweigh all the negative comments. But I don't know. It almost just kind of makes me hate people. Because you would never say this to my face and they just get on and it's like, why? If you don't like it, just move along. I don't think I've ever wrote a negative comment on somebody's YouTube. If I don't like it, I just stop watching it. It's as simple as that, isn't it? You know, if you don't like the content, just move on. I, mm -hmm. I'm with you. Yeah. But at the end of the day, it's very rewarding, you know, just putting in that effort. And I've had a number of people recruited to my agency through my channel number of people getting into EMS and law enforcement because of my channel, or at least they tell me it's because of my channel. So, you know, for me, that's, that's 100% worth it because it's showing people, you know, how they can serve their communities going forward. And I think that's super valuable. Absolutely. If listeners want to find you on internet, social media, YouTube, where can they find you? Yeah. So I've got my YouTube channel is Prep Medic. You search that, it'll pop right up. And then I am on Instagram, which it's prep underscore medic on there. So, you know, a little less educational content on the Instagram, just kind of try to post some cool pictures, but follow me on either of those. Okay, awesome. 
IWI. Guys, if you haven't done so, check out the TS-12 shotgun. I have one. I'll have a ton of fun shooting that thing. It's basically a high-capacity shotgun that doesn't require a long extended tube or extremely long magazines. It has three rotating tubes that automatically load when rotated. So essentially, you have 15 plus one capacity. It also has a tunable gas system so that you can adjust the different loads and includes M-lock attachment points and a Picatinny rail on top for mounting an optic or irons. Also, if you want to change chokes or attach a suppressor, it's compatible with the Benelli Beretta choke tubes. Also, check out the accessories that they have on their website when you visit iwi.us. Any of the accessories, if you use the code GUNFUNNY15, you get 15% off your order. Politics. What is going on in the world today? It's political AF. Gun control activists cry foul over Judge Benitez taking another Second Amendment case. Our favorite Ninth Circuit judge, Roger Benitez from San Diego, who previously ruled against California's magazine ban and law requiring a background check to buy ammunition, began hearing another firearms case on Monday. Anti-gun groups are upset that he's presiding over the case because they didn't like his rulings in Duncan versus Bracera or Road versus Becerra and are screaming that he is biased for the Second Amendment. Federal law, however, allows judges to take related cases, and this happens to be many times in the past. For example, federal judge Jack B. Weinstein in New York consistently ruled against gun rights for years, and of course, gun control activists basically just cheered him on. The new case before Judge Benitez is Miller v. Bursera, which challenges several state laws defining assault weapons and the associate bans, which I love this because I can't stand when somebody uses the term assault weapon or assault rifle because it doesn't exist. Ashley Lubinsky, who I actually had her on the show maybe two years ago, former curator of the Cody Firearms Museum and renowned firearms historian, testified as an expert witness in the case on Monday. Additional testimony has continued this week and hopefully will wrap up Friday. Plaintiffs include the Second Amendment Foundation, Firearms Policy Coalition, California Gun Rights Foundation, San Diego County Gun Owners, PAC, two private businesses, and five private citizens. If Judge Benitez again rules in favor of the right to keep and bear arms, as we hope, just like with the MAG ban and ammo ban cases, we can expect the state to appeal immediately for an en blanc hearing before a larger panel. Just like the previous 2A cases Judge Benitez ruled on, these will ultimately be decided in the Supreme Court, so the outcome of the election has never been more critical to keep new Supreme Court appointments strong supporters of the Constitution. Guys, this is why it's extremely important to get out there and vote, because let's face it, if Biden and Harris get in to office, they've bragged pretty loudly that they plan on banning, quote unquote, assault weapons. So this definitely will not help with the 2A community. Do you have anything that you would like to add to that, Sam? You know, I just think it's frustrating in some of these situations. You know, you've got a lot of legislation and ignorance, I think, and as small as it might be, but just calling everything an assault weapon and not having a really good understanding of what that means and what capabilities are of different firearms, I think it leads down kind of a dangerous road. Yeah. And also, I would like to add that I'm extremely thankful for Judge Benitez because we definitely need more people like him, especially in California. He's definitely fighting the good fight, and I hope he continues to do so. Smith & Wesson. If you've been wanting to get into long-range shooting, but you're not sure where to start with all the models and the things that people tell you, I would highly recommend check out the T-CLRR long-range bundles from Smith & Wesson Performance Center. The Precision Bolt Gun was designed for extremely long-range precision and includes all the features that you would spend several thousand getting done to other rifles in a custom shop. It comes with a 5R barrel. So if you're not familiar with 5R, it refers to the number of rifle grooves in the barrel. Traditionally, most of the rifles have six, which puts the ridges of the rifling directly opposite of each other. 
which deforms the bullet more, having an adverse impact on the ballistic coefficient. It comes with a great looking chassis and a 10 round magazine, as well as the skeletonized butt stock that is adjustable for length of pull and cheek height. You can get them in 308, 6.5 Creedmoor, and 243 Winchester. The bundle includes a Vortex 4 12 scope wind meter and a bipod. So basically, you're getting all of that. Best part is MSRP is only $1,503. Definitely check that out. That is at smith wesson.com. QA There's no such thing as a stupid question. Just kidding. Visit gunfunny.com forward slash contact to submit yours. Today's question is, for someone wanting to get their first suppressor, is it worth getting a trust? I would say yes, absolutely. Even if you're only going to have a single suppressor because it gives you the ability to name a beneficiary, which you can't do on an individual form. And also you can have co-trustees that can legally have possession of the suppressor. Suppressor trusts are not that expensive either. You're looking at about $100 to $200. It's not going to cost you a lot. And, you know, you can then pass it on to somebody else. Sam, do you have any suppressors or NFA items? You know, I wish. That's something I've been looking at getting into for a while. I had a bunch of friends in Iowa that had them, and I was allowed to have them as a law enforcement officer. But I think that's one of my next steps. Yeah. It's definitely fun. And even shooting just suppressed, I don't know why it's such a big deal that you have to fill out all this paperwork and wait months and pay the tax stamp. Ultimately, it just, in my opinion, boils down to the government making more money. But just shooting suppressed, it helps significantly. It's so much more pleasant. It's not like it makes the gun silent. You can still hear it, but it's just a lot easier on your ears and for the people around you who are shooting. Yeah, when we go to the range with the SWAT team, it's amazing. You want to pair yourself up with the person that has a suppressor on. Right. You know, you're know, you next to the guy with the horrible break. It blows off your ear pro or mm-hmm. whatever it is. You know, And then you get to shoot next to the guy with the suppressor. It's just, it's so much more relaxing. Yeah, absolutely. Completely agree. The Heat Seeker Chassis. So you guys have heard me talk about it before. It's a great looking blend of aluminum chassis and carbon fiber that makes a great lightweight build for predator hunting with the Howa 1500 Mini Action. The great thing about the design is it accepts AR grips and buffer tubes, so you can design it however you'd like. Those are on sale right now for $549, but something that is coming in our way is the new Sharps Pros Heat Seeker for the Ruger American. There's no release date on that, but there's been a few pictures posted on their Instagram. So check that out. That is at sharpsbros.com. Tactic Talk. Discussing popular guns and gear. Love it? Hate it? Find out now. Primary Arms released new scope for long-range shooters. I recently had Dimitri from Primary Arms on the show to discuss the ACSS reticle, among other things. They just released a new long-range precision optic with another of the ACSS reticles he designed. It's the GLX 4-16 by 50 millimeter. Has the ACSS Apollo reticle calibrated for the 6.5 Creedmoor and the 224 Valkyrie in the front focal plane. The GLX line of scopes is designed to bring high-end precision optic performance at an affordable price. While affordable, they are rigorously tested with thousands of rounds to make sure that they hold up. For any of you not familiar with front focal plane versus second focal plane optics, it refers to which lens of the optic the reticle is etched on. On a second focal plane reticle, when you adjust the power of the scope, the reticle appears to be the same size to your eyes. This means that the amount of distance between the hold lines is magnified by the change in magnification. SFP reticles are usually calibrated for the highest magnification. In contrast, reticles etched in the front lens do not change the hold value when you adjust magnification. The hold lines are for the same amount regardless of power. Traditionally, FFP scopes are more expensive because etching the reticle in the front lens requires a much smaller and more precise manufacturing process because the reticle is physically much smaller in the lens. The ACSS Apollo reticle has a lot of capability 
built into it for drop compensation with wind holds, but it's not packed so tight to be overwhelming. The scope also includes lockable, resettable zero stops, which is something you generally pay a premium for with long range optics. Zero stops, if you aren't familiar with them, allows you to physically lock a zero in the scope, for example, at 100 yards. Then you can dial out for 1,000 yard drop in and rotate the turret back and it will stop at your 100 yard zero. All in all, it looks like a pretty amazing scope. The cost for it is $699, which is pretty freaking affordable considering most optics out there. And it includes a ton of extra features. Have you had a chance to check out any of the primary arms optics? I have not. Okay. You know, Sam, what are you living under a rock? No, I'm kidding. <laughs> No, I'm just kidding. I actually, I had one that I got a few years ago, but up until recently, I really haven't had time to check out a lot of their optics, but I did get my hands on a few and they're really nice. And the best part about it is really they're extremely affordable because, oh, you just dumped maybe 2000 or more into your gun and, oh yeah, I got to get the optic now. And the optic is not cheap by any means. I'm definitely a fan when quality and affordability come together. If you haven't checked out the new PAD PF940SC slides, you really need to. They look really sleek compared to the other similar price slides on the market. The front and rear serrations on them look really cool and, of course, provide a much better grip than your typical Glock serrations. You can get them in black nitride or silver finish and stripped or completed as kits. Check them out at polymer80.com. Don't forget to use that code GUNFUNNY. That gets you 15% off that order. Stupid. Funny. Cool. Interesting. Awesome. As... Never mind. A.F. Sam, are you a fan of Twinkies? I am, actually. Really? When's the last time you had a Twinkie? I had one last week, actually. Really? I don't remember the last time I had a Twinkie, but I do... Actually, no, I'm a fan of Little Debbie snacks, but Hostess, I don't know. Sometimes I look at it, that just can't be healthy. Not to say that Little Debbie's stepping her game up more than Hostess is, but I don't know. Somehow that's how I justify it in my mind. But recently, there was a mummified Twinkie that's been baffling scientists. Twinkies have an iconic reputation for their shelf life. TV shows involving nuclear zombie apocalypse have featured them as lasting almost indefinitely. Officially, Twinkies have a 45-day shelf life. However, they are rumored to stay edible practically for all eternity. One Twinkie is known to have been preserved since 1976. Back in 2012, remember when the company was going out of business and everyone ran to the grocery store and hoarded a bunch of Twinkies? Yep. And I remember, I think on eBay, there were Twinkies selling for astronomical prices. And I'm like, okay, I like Twinkies, but I don't like them enough to spend $1,000 on one Twinkie, which honestly, that was the case. The company was then purchased in bankruptcy proceedings and still makes Twinkies under the Hostess brand. This obviously left a surplus of Twinkies in some people's pantries. Colin Perrington from Pennsylvania happened to purchase a box of Twinkies in 2012. Then came coronavirus apocalypse. Earlier this month, Perrington was sitting at home, bored, wanted a snack, but he didn't have anything in his house. Then he remembered that box of Twinkies that he bought back in 2012. He opened up the box and unwrapped one, one bite, and he felt like throwing up. He specifically said it tasted like old sock, not that I've ever eaten old sock. He looked at the other Twinkies in the box. Several looked pretty bad, and another was shriveled up like a gray, wrinkled mummy. He took pictures of the mummified Twinkie and posted it on Twitter. Scientists Brian Lovett and Matt Kaysen at West Virginia University saw the picture and immediately wanted the Twinkie because they study fungi. They previously did a study on how mold does not grow well on peeps. They observed that the Twinkie was still vacuum-packed, which meant the fungus was in the wrapper before being sealed and that it consumed all the oxygen inside the wrapper as it grew, which stopped the fungus from growing further. The cream in the center was still soft. I guess I get some joy out of knowing that there's people out there getting paid to study if stuff grows on Twinkies and Peeps. 
but I don't think I'd want to eat that. Yeah, absolutely not. They're baffled that they cannot culture the fungi, but continue to study it. So if you're one of those people with a surplus of old Twinkies, you might want to reconsider eating them now because it turns out that they don't have an indefinite shelf life. 2012 when he bought that, that was eight years ago. Honestly, every year I go through my pantry and if there's anything that I haven't eaten, I usually just donate it. Because if it's been a year, same with my clothes. I'll go through my closet. If I haven't worn it in a year, I have to get rid of it. I'm not the hoarder type. So I don't think that I would hang on to a box of Twinkies, especially for eight years. I don't think they'd last in my house that long. Somebody would eat them. (laughs) Yeah, no kidding. Yeah, that's actually really true. All of the junk food gets eaten in my house. And it's not because I have little kids. It's just Tickles and I. With so many things back ordered due to everyone buying everything, the entire buying frenzy, it occurred to me that now would be the perfect time to do some custom work on your existing guns. So you can give your old Glock a optic cut. You can have it serrated, custom finish, recontoured, stippled for a solid grip, all kinds of things. And your go-to spot would be triarchsystems.com. They do anything and everything. Don't forget to use the code AVA, A-V-A, and that gets you 5% off. And that is at triarchsystems.com. And now it's time for iTunes reviews. First review is BizNasty675. The podcast rabbit hole led me here. Five stars. I've never been one for podcasts until recently. Started with Crowder and now I'm here. I'm about six episodes in with a huge back catalog to keep me entertained. Glad Smith & Wesson picked you up. The MMP 2.0 5 inch is my favorite handgun. Keep it up. Well, you have good taste because I just got the MMP 2.0 optic ready and I am loving that gun. Second review is the Michael Hinman titled, I Love Gun Funny, five stars. I never used to be into podcasts much, but I love gun funny. I learn something new every show and it helps make work go by faster. Aw, thanks, Michael. Sam, out of those two reviews, the first or the second, pick one to win a lucky prize pack. Oh man, I have to go with number two because it's all about getting through that work day. Yeah, I know. And guys, I'm glad that I can make the work week a little bit easier for you. (laughs) I definitely don't miss that nine to five job. Although, coincidentally, being self-employed, you definitely work more than nine to five. (laughs) It's, yeah, not a... Labor of love, though. Yeah, exactly. All right, guys, now it's time to wrap up. So check me out at gunfunny.com. Don't forget to follow us on social media. This is typically where I'd say become a patron, but I'm actually changing things up a little bit. So given the ups and downs that some content creators have had with Patreon and the portion that they take from every donation, I decided to set up my own version of Patreon on the GunFunny website. In order to switch over, all you have to do is go to GunFunny.com, select the support the show link in the menu, or just click the link in the show notes. And no one's card is going to be charged until the first of every month. Don't think that you're going to be charged double this month. If you switch over, it charges you and then charges you again on the first. That's not going to be the case. Just make sure that you cancel your Patreon pledge at patreon.com forward slash gunfunny. Patreon will still remain active. So if you want to continue pledging there, that's totally fine. Either way, your support is much appreciated. So thank you for that. And that is at gunfunny.com. Also, Blown Deadline gives away a $300 gift certificate each month to a lucky Patreon. I don't know if you guys checked him out on social media, but he's doing some really cool digital Cerakote thing that looks amazing that I've not seen done before. He's always raising the bar. Also, I wanted to thank the $25 patrons who are Corbin Bonafide, Iraq Veteran 8888, Ryan Morrison, Elliot and Mike Pappas, Joe Lyons, Justin Paulson, Jason Anderson, Joshua Hamp, Sportsman's Guide, Daniel Treadwell, Star Wars 77, and Ralph Anthony. King of the Patreons, Jon Snow wants me to say, Operator Tickles once bit her shadow because it was following too close. It now stays 15 feet behind her. (laughs) All right. And Sam, thank you once again for joining me. And thank you for everything that you do. I think that medical education is extremely important. And guys, if you haven't done so, definitely go out and educate yourself. Or if there aren't any classes available, check out Sam's YouTube channel. But Sam, can you just remind people once again where they can find you? 
Absolutely. They can find me on YouTube at prep medic or on Instagram at prep underscore medic. All right. Awesome. Well, on that note, we are out of here. Want to send feedback? Tell us about a company or anything else. Go to gunfunny.com forward slash contact. <laughs>